Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, I'm going to wait uh, maybe another 30 to 45 seconds to let more people enter the webinar, and uh, then we'll begin. Okay, well, thank you for joining us today for this APA webinar on the future of open science and the need to change culture to change science. Uh, this webinar is being hosted by the American Psychological Association. APA is the world's largest association of psychologists and is strongly committed to a large number of activities designed to improve, promote, and disseminate psychological science. Uh, just a few examples. Uh, APA is extremely active in federal advocacy to protect and increase our scientists' ability to do our work. APA communicates psychological science to the general public. It promotes our science to a wide array of agencies and disciplines. And APA creates opportunities for essential dialogue that moves our field forward. My name is Peggy Christidis. I'm a science program officer in the science directorate of APA, and I will be serving as moderator for today's essential dialogue on open science. Uh, we have an amazing speaker today, but before I introduce him and get us started, I wanted to just go over a few details. Uh, many of you sent in questions ahead of time when you registered, and uh, many of those questions have already been incorporated into today's talk. So thank you for submitting those questions ahead of time. But you will also have the opportunity to type in a question as the webinar is taking place in real time. The GoToWebinar control panel has a questions tab, and you can type your question into the little box that appears. We really want to make this webinar as uh, interactive as possible. We want it to be more of a two-way conversation rather than just a, you know, a static lecture. So please feel free to use that chat box frequently to ask questions, to share your experiences, and provide comments. The webinar is being recorded, so once the webinar ends, everyone who registered will receive an email with a link to the recording. And you should receive that email about two hours after the webinar ends. The slides presented today will also be shared with our audience members in PDF format. If you can, don't, you can download them right now, actually, if you like, by going to your GoToWebinar dashboard and clicking on the handout section. You'll find the PDF in there. If you run into any trouble downloading the files, uh, no worries. We will have the slides, the webinar recording, and even a transcription of the webinar available in a couple of places on the APA website. It'll take a few days to get these things posted, but you will receive an email notification uh, from APA when these things become available. And you'll see those links there in the chat box as well. And finally, we will be sending you a short post-webinar survey. So if you can, please take a moment to fill that out. We'd like to know if you are interested in seeing more webinars about open science. And if so, what are some topics you'd be interested in hearing more about? So without further ado, let's begin. Uh, Dr. Brian Nosek has joined us today to talk about why changing the culture of how we conduct and report science is so essential to improving the openness, rigor, and reproducibility of psychological science. Dr. Nosek is co-founder and executive director of the Center for Open Science. The center operates the Open Science Framework, or OSF, which is a collaborative management service for registering studies and archiving and sharing research materials and data. Dr. Nosek is also a professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Virginia, and he co-founded Project Implicit, which is a multi-university collaboration for research and education investigating implicit cognition. Okay, welcome to the webinar, Brian. We're thrilled to have you. 
And there we are, I can see you. Whenever you are ready, please turn, oh, your camera's on, your audio is ready, and you can begin. Great, thank you very much, Peggy, and thanks everyone uh, for joining this webinar today. I'm delighted uh, to have a chance to present uh, to you about some of this work. As Peggy indicated, my basic research interest is in the gap between values and practices what we think we should do, what we want to do, what we're trying to do versus what we actually do in our everyday behavior. And most of my substantive work uh, in the lab about that has been on uh, implicit bias, thoughts and feelings outside of awareness or control and how they might lead us to do things that are contrary to our values and how the structure of the system, the culture may provide constraint on how it is we can best live according to our values. The Center for Open Science is a practical application of that basic research interest, which is really trying to wrestle with the gap between scientific values and scientific practices, how we idealize science to operate, how we think it should operate, what we want to do, versus how the system actually works, how people are rewarded and how they behave and how they might do things inconsistent uh, with the values that we aspire to for the scientific process. So what I'd like to do today is give a very brief uh, sense of what is the challenge uh, that, uh, that we are motivated by uh, through the center and as a, as a community activity more generally to try to improve research practices. How does open science and some of the things that are associated with it uh, offer some potential solutions? What are some initial evidence uh, that this, these are working and starting to have some impact? And then closing with what can we individually do to contribute to that ever, ever not never ending effort uh, to be improving, uh, to do our practices better today than we did them yesterday, uh, and to accelerate the discovery of knowledge and solutions and cures uh, like we are in the business of science to do. So next slide, please. So we can start in thinking about sort of a fundamental question, why? Why are you in research? Why did I start doing research? And an answer that you might think about if you're considering why am I here? Why did I start doing research in the first place? Might be something like this. Right? I'm curious and like to discover new things. I like solving problems, learning, and working with others to figure things out. I'm particularly interested in your problem X. Alternatively, you might answer something like, next slide, I like writing papers, trying to get them published, often with lots of rounds of revisions and applying for grants. I'm particularly interested in obtaining a high H index. Now, if you're trying to decide which of these better represents you, if you are like many others uh, where I've uh, presented this, uh, <laughs> this contrast, uh, it's, it's pretty clear the one on the left is a better characterization of those intrinsic motivations that we bring to why we got into science and how uh, we intend to engage our research. Simultaneously, it's also easy to recognize the pull of the things on the right as the concrete realities that we face of trying to get a job, trying to keep our job in science, trying to advance in our career. The careerism elements of advancing in science put us in a position of needing to think about our work, our research in terms of getting papers, publishing things, getting grants, getting citation counts, all of those things that are concrete indicators, whatever their flaws, of the fact that we are contributing in some way to the scientific discipline. We're not gonna get rid of those things easily, uh, but what this puts up uh, into our faces is this idea of what are our intrinsic motives? What is it we're trying to do? Why are we here? Versus what are the extrinsic rewards? And are they always aligned? Are the things that we have to do to have a career, to advance in our career, the things that are befitting the goals, the approach, the motivations that we have for doing the science in the first place? So we can think about this in the next slide in terms of the values uh, of how we think about science should operate. There are many different uh, ways that the values of science or the norms of science have been characterized. These are the 
characterizations from Robert Merton on the left, his norms of science from the 1940s and 50s when he first tried to characterize this. Uh, and you might recognize these as ways in which researchers uh, or sociologists or philosophers of science have described how science as a system operates, or at least is intended to operate, right? One norm is communality, the open sharing of information. When I make a research claim, it doesn't become trustworthy or credible because I just say, trust me, trust me, that's what I found, it becomes credible based on you being able to see how is it that I got to that claim. Here's the methodology that I applied. Here's the data that that generated. Here's the inference process that I applied to that data. That transparency gives you a basis for deciding whether the claims I'm inserting into the public sphere are worth taking seriously, right? Versus the counter norm of secrecy. No, 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 just trust me. This is what I found, trust me. A second norm, universalism. Right? Research is evaluated based on its own merit. It's the methodology itself that determines the credibility of the evidence produced rather than particularism. Oh, she's famous, she must know what she's talking about. I guess we'll believe that now. A third norm is disinterestedness. Researchers are motivated by knowledge and discovery, just trying to figure out how it all works versus the counter norm of self-interestedness, right? Research, the reason we're in research is to get the jobs and to get the rewards and to advance in our careers. And that's what's the driver. The fourth norm, organized skepticism. A researcher considers all new evidence, even against their prior work, versus organized dogmatism. I got my dissertation published, and now I'm gonna spend the rest of my career defending the claims in my dissertation from all those people that have different ideas about how that works. And then the last norm isn't one that Merton proposed, but is a commonly discussed norm, a norm of quality versus the counter norm of quantity. So now we might look at these and say, oh, we can recognize that these are ways in which people have characterized how science should operate uh, as a way of knowing things about the world compared to other ways of knowing. But it's an obvious question to say, do researchers actually endorse the norms over the counter norms? Next slide uh, is an example of an investigation of exactly that. Anderson and her colleagues did a survey of 3,300 or so NIH awardees and asked them, which of these do you endorse? How science should operate, the norm or the counter norm? And what you're seeing here is the cumulative data across uh, the various norms, where in gray uh, are the proportion of respondents that said they endorse the norms over the counter norms on average, right? 90% of the sample. Early career here are researchers in postdoctoral positions, mid-career average age around 40 plus. In black are those that said, no, 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 I endorse, I think science should operate by the counter norms on average more than the norms. And in gray hatch are people who say, no, about equal weight uh, between these two. So you can see there's nearly universal endorsement of the norms over the counter norms. So then Anderson and her colleagues said, okay, great, that's fine. Don't tell me what you endorse, tell me how you behave in your everyday research. And next slide, it looks like this. So still people say that about 60% of people say that they behave according to the norms over the counter norms, but you can see a much more substantial number are indicating that those counter norms have perhaps equivalent weight uh, on their behavior, both the norms and counter norms. And still very, very few are saying they behave according to the counter norms over the norms. So they say, okay, that's great, that's fine. Don't tell me now what, how you behave. Tell me how the other people in your field, how do they behave? And next slide shows that response. What you see here is a very different perception of the culture than on the top, what people endorse as how the culture they think should be, right? At the bottom, people perceive the culture to be driven by and large by the counter norms over the norms. And the great irony here is that it's the same people right? The people themselves comprise the culture. The people themselves endorse the norms of science over the counter norms. And those, all those same people perceive that, in fact, the culture does not align with those norms. Instead, it aligns more with the counter norms. And this is what we might characterize as a dysfunctional culture, right? If we all think the system all, in quotes, think the system should operate a, a way that's different than how it's operating, 
then the system is not aligning to the values that we collectively share. And that creates an opportunity. We have a different set of values. How might we, as members of that culture, start to cultivate change so that we can align the reward systems, the demands, the norms in the system with the values that we bring to it? And if we can get that top set of bars aligned with the bottom, then we will have a much more functional culture where we will be living in an environment that is aligned with the values that we bring to that environment. So because of that misalignment at present, we put researchers individually in a difficult situation. I have the values for how I think I should do my science. I don't perceive that the culture is aligned with those values, so I have a choice to make. Either I can live to my values and as a consequence, perceive that I will be disadvantaging my career interests, getting a job, keeping a job, advancing my career. Or I could give up on those values and do what I think it takes to survive uh, in science, to have a career in the first place. We shouldn't want that kind of decision to be in anyone's mind. And so this is really the key opportunity for thinking, how might we start to push on the culture itself to nudge those incentives and rewards so that we improve the alignment between our values and our practices. So there are many ways we could characterize what are the challenges of that research culture for producing this alignment. We focus on a very uh, specific and we think consequential element of that research culture. The next slide. And that is that the incentives for my success are focused on me getting it published, not on me getting it right. Of course, I wanna get it right. I got into science to figure things out, to discover things. I like working on knowledge. I want everything that I publish to be right uh, in some way. But whether it's right or wrong is not what I get rewarded for. What I get rewarded for is publishing it, publishing frequently and publishing in prestigious outlets. And we know that not everything that we do in the lab gets published. Some things are more likely to be published than other things. I'm more likely to get published if I find a positive result rather than a negative result. This intervention works. These variables are related versus, eh, this didn't quite work out as we might have hypothesized. I'm more likely to get published if I find a novel result rather than repeat something or provide additional evidence about something that someone else had claimed previously. And I'm more likely to get published if I have a neat and tidy story. All of the evidence fits together and reinforces the conclusions that I advance in the paper. So a novel, positive, tidy story is the best kind of story in science. And it's the most publishable and it's the best kind of accomplishment. Because if you can discover something new, provide lots of evidence for it, and have a package that fits between the theoretical conceptualization and the empirical evidence supporting it, you've made an amazing contribution to research. But the challenge that we all collectively inhabit is that that doesn't happen very often. Right? We're studying things we don't understand. That's why we study them. It's really hard uh, to figure it out. There's lots of false starts. There's lots of things that don't make sense. There's lots of evidence that doesn't quite fit together in a neat, coherent story. And it can take a lifetime, a career time, to get from that initial phase of what's going on here to that neat and tidy story that has a strong explanatory framework and all of the evidence being reinforced. But the reward cycle doesn't work on the career timeline. It works on the paper by paper timeline. And we have this need, demand, reward system that says novel, positive, tidy, novel, positive, tidy, over and over and over again. And because I have discretion, in what it is I write in my papers, I have lots of opportunity to do things that will bias the evidence toward publishability and away from credibility. Right? I do lots of experiments in the lab, only a subset get into the papers. What's the selection process for which subset get into the paper? Right? I'm much more likely to rationalize to myself that that paper, that study that showed negative evidence compared to those studies that showed positive evidence for my hypothesis. Well, that, that other study, that was a bad study. I don't know why we did that study. Let's put that one aside, All right? There are multiple analysis strategies I might deploy on a particular set of data to investigate my hypothesis. 
as I see what the findings are, I may easily rationalize to myself without intending to, but because I have skin in the game, that the analyses that look better for publication are in fact the right way to analyze the data rather than the ones that aren't as won't make the paper as publishable. So there's lots of potential for the system to create exaggerated evidence, exaggerated sense of what the, the credibility is of our publications because of the critical demand on us and the reward system that's applied to us. The next slide. The consequences of this are palpable in a variety of different areas of meta research investigating the scientific process. This is a summary slide of some systematic efforts to try to replicate findings in the psychological literature. This comes from an annual review piece that we just posted. I've links to it in the, in the slides. What you're seeing here on the first three panels uh, are the replication studies in individual dots uh, for systematically selected areas of uh, research. A, a paper by Soto looking at personality and health correlates, a uh, paper by Cameron and colleagues that tried to replicate a sample of uh, experimental social behavioral science findings uh, from published in science and nature journals. And then the third panel being from the Open Science Collaboration, popularly known as the Reproducibility Project in Psychology, trying to replicate 100 studies uh, from a sample of, of three journals in psychology. And what you see when we return to these original findings and try to replicate uh, those studies using high powered designs and as best evidence, uh, best methodology uh, that could be done in that context uh, is that many of the findings are below the dotted line. At the dotted line would mean that the replication effect size is the same uh, as the original effect size. Below the line meaning, means that the replication observed a smaller effect than the original, and above the line would mean that the replication observed a larger effect than the original. It's also another indicator of replicability, and the solid dots are those that in the replication achieve statistical significance in the same direction as the original, P less than 0.05, and the open dots are those that did not. So there are multiple ways to assess replicability, but these two just give you a general sense of what happens when we try to replicate a sample of findings uh, from the published literature. Uh, what typically happens in these systematic studies is that the replication effect sizes are smaller, about half to 60% the size of the original findings, and uh, the obtaining of statistical significance is less frequent, uh, ranging between 30% to 50% uh, of those original findings. The fourth panel, I should say, is an aggregation of many labs uh, kinds of replication studies where a particular phenomenon was subjected to replication across many different settings and samples. And these are the aggregate estimates across lots of these uh, that got pulled together. So they all converge to that conclusion that the published evidence may be somewhat exaggerated uh, from the reality of what the evidence is justified in that context. Now, of course, no individual replication study provides any definitive resolution of any individual original finding. It itself could be a false negative, missing the phenomenon that the original study uh, observed, or there may be important differences uh, between the original and replication study that count for why they observe different effects. All of that remains true as part of the active uh, research process trying to understand phenomena. But the collective evidence suggests that when these replications are conducted, even when they have peer review in advance by experts, that the evidence collected through these replications tends to be weaker than original studies. So that provides some of the basis for saying that maybe there are practices that we could introduce, new behaviors that might increase the credibility of the literature and as a side effect, increase the replicability to some degree. Next slide. So there are a variety of different things that we might consider for what solutions to adopt. The ones I want to focus on in our discussion are these three, open data, open materials, and pre-registration. If you have access to the data uh, behind the papers, uh, the claims that I make in papers, then there are a number of things that don't directly impact its replicability, but gives you the opportunity to assess the credibility of the claims that I make. 
right? You can reanalyze that data, see if you can reproduce the findings that are reported in the paper. Just make sure I didn't make a mistake uh, in how we analyzed or reported the data. Uh, you could subject the data to different types of analyses, right? There are many different potential analysis pipelines. Uh, maybe if I included that covariate or included a couple of different covariates, a different outcome might have been observed. It's useful to know how robust our findings are to the various decisions that we can make that are all reasonable decisions in that analysis pipeline. You could also then take that data and combine it with other data more effectively for more efficient, more effective meta-analyses or even new analyses of different fi findings, potential claims uh, that I didn't consider in that initial analysis. For open materials, it can be very useful for you to see more clearly how it is I got to the claims that I got to. Right? The paper itself is my summarization of what I think is important to tell you about how we did the research. But when you see the actual protocol, the procedures, the actual measures themselves, you may come to a very different understanding than I had uh, of what the research was actually doing, what the claims actually are, what the interpretation, what kind of interpretation is reasonable. So having transparency of those materials gives you a better way uh, to understand, critique, and potentially extend uh, the work uh, that I did in those papers. Because then you can adapt those materials. You can use them, reuse them, change them in ways that will help unpack the phenomena that I investigated. And then the third, pre-registration, has two key roles to play uh, in potentially improving or clarifying the credibility of research. The first is that if I pre-register each of my studies and make a commitment, pre-registration means laying out what the plan is. This is the study that I'm going to do, and if I have planned analyses in advance, then putting those uh, into the pre-registration and posting that to an independent registry. If I register the studies that I'm going to do, then even if they don't wind up in the paper, they are at least in principle discoverable so that when you are doing a search, you can look at the paper that I wrote, and there's the three studies that I had about that phenomenon, but then you can also see in the registry that I had 10 additional studies that were about related things that weren't reported in the paper, and then you can ask, well, what's up with those? Like, what happened? So that we can get a more comprehensive understanding of the evidence base, regardless of whether it ends up in papers or not. And then the second key role of pre-registration is to make it really clear when I'm reporting analyses that I planned in advance versus those that I did not. Both of these modes of investigation, confirmatory or hypothesis testing, where I have ideas that I'm applying uh, to this data to test, see if the data conform to that initial hypothesis or conception that I have, and hypothesis generating or exploratory work, where I'm digging into the data and learning from the data and generating ideas of what might be possible. Both of those modes of analysis are incredibly important to research, right? A lot of discovery of new directions of innovation comes from exploration of being surprised uh, by things that we didn't anticipate happening in our research, but nevertheless popped out and sent us in new directions. So we have to be prepared to be responsive to the data as it comes, if we're really going to break new ground uh, in research. But simultaneously, it needs to be clear to us uh, and to you as the reader of the work that I did that those were discoveries after the fact, that they weren't what I planned in advance, but rather they're things that the data confronted us with. And by nature, that means they're more uncertain to some degree than the tests that I did where I'm confronting things without knowing what the answer is. I'm designing how it is I'm going to test that question and pushing that to data. Having that clarity of which things came out through exploratory analysis versus which things were planned and st the statistics applied uh, to have as much the strongest diagnostic uh, inferences as possible gives me and you confidence in understanding the degree of uncertainty in the various findings that I report. So if we can advance that, we should potentially improve both the credibility of the literature and the ability to assess the credibility of any given finding. Okay, so those are the behaviors that we try to promote uh, in a lot of open science to see if we can increase both the transparency, accessibility, and ultimately the credibility of research findings. Next slide. 
So one obvious question is, do they work? Uh, do they actually meet the promise that we have? And this is obviously a big question, right? Can we accelerate research by doing these behaviors? We're not gonna get evidence for that very quickly, but there is a very healthy meta science research community that is evaluating these kinds of new practices to see where they have strengths, where they have weaknesses, where they apply and where they don't apply, and where they actually are showing evidence of meeting their promise, or whether the conceptualization of them was wrong and need to change strategies. Here is one example uh, that tried to adopt best practices and then assess whether that changed replicability as a consequence. So my lab uh, participated in this prospective replication project with Jonathan Schooler's lab at UC Santa Barbara, Leif Nelson's at UC Berkeley, and John Krosnick's uh, at Stanford. And what we did in this project was that each of our labs did its research, motivated by the questions it's motivated by in the domains that it uh, studies. And when we discovered something in our lab, right, we have a new finding, we think this is a new direction, this is gonna lead us to uh, an, something that we might write up as a paper, then we could submit that finding uh, for this program. And what submitting it meant was that I submit this finding, say we think we got something, then at that point we do a confirmation study. Our lab pre-registers the methodology, the design, the analysis plan, does a confirmation study uh, to uh, according to that pre-registration. And then after our confirmation study, regardless of what happened in it, uh, the methodology then is sent to the next lab for them to do a replication. And it goes on round robin replication where each lab does a replication of each other's lab's new findings. And so each of the four labs generated four novel findings over this five year project, generating 16 new findings. Each of those 16 findings had a confirmation study to nail down what it is we think it is. And then each of those was replicated by each of the four labs. Right? The three independent labs and then one self-replication. So that meant 48 independent replications. So the materials were shared, pre-registration was invoked, and there was attention to let's try to adopt best practice as researchers uh, have been starting to do in uh, this open science work. And what we observe, next slide, is in the fifth panel of that replication study. So now on the far right, this is the same, uh, uh, same figure uh, as before of all these replications. And this best practices study is on the far right. And what you can see here is that those findings hug very close to the zero line. And what that means is that the replication effect sizes were very similar uh, to the original study effect sizes, that confirmation study. In fact, the replications were 97% of the effect size of the original studies, uh, suggesting that high replicability is achievable and based on some collection of practices uh, that occurred uh, in this study. This was a kitchen sink uh, intervention. Right? We said, let's just adopt all the practices and see uh, what, how this goes. Large samples, pre-registration, uh, good sharing of materials, et cetera, uh, and high replicability was achieved. Subsequent work can try to start unpacking this and say, is it some are, are some of these particular behaviors more impactful than others for achieving uh, good estimates and ultimately replicability? But at least it provides a proof of concept that high replicability is achievable in our areas of research. Uh, and now the question is, let's how, how do we understand that in finer detail? Okay, next slide. Another intervention that's been getting a lot of interest uh, in psychology is the idea of changing how it is we decide what gets to be published or not. Uh, and this is the model of registered reports. Right, so this is the cartoon uh, of how research happens, right? You design a study, you collect and analyze the data, you write the report, and then you publish it. But of course, it's not that easy. Next slide shows that there's this blocker uh, between report uh, and the publication of peer review. In this context, as we started from the beginning, the challenge is that the research is done and all of the incentives are for making that report as beautiful as possible so that it gets through peer review eventually and becomes a publication. 
but it's about the outcomes. Are they novel enough? Are they positive enough? Are they tidy enough? Do we understand this phenomenon now? And that means that the incentives are about making the outcomes beautiful. The key intervention with registered reports is to do one significant change to this. Next slide. And that is to move peer review at the primary stage to just after the design phase. So what I do as an author in registered reports is write up the research question I want to investigate, the background about why that's an important question, maybe some preliminary evidence or studies that I did to sort of give some shape to that, and then the proposed methodology for the study or studies that I'm going to do to test the question that I motivated. I don't have the data yet or the outcomes. And what the reviewers evaluate is, are you asking an important question? And is this methodology an effective methodology to test that question? And if it passes those questions, then the paper gets in principle acceptance here. And what that means is that the editor agrees that if I follow through with what I said I was gonna do, and I show that I executed it competently, I ran the study as I said I was going to run it, then it will be published regardless of the outcomes, whether they confirm or disconfirm my hypothesis, whether they're positive or negative results, whether they're neat and tidy, or whether they're a mess. And so then when I do, then I get my in principle acceptance, I go back and I do my work, I write up the report, and then when I submit it for stage two review after the report, the reviewers aren't evaluating, was he right, or is it exciting? They're evaluating, did he do what he said he was gonna do? And did he interpret the outcomes responsibly based on what the evidence actually suggests? And then it's published. Just that change fundamentally shifts the incentives for me as the author, right? In the normal model, the incentives are all about the outcomes. In the registered reports model, the incentives for me are ask the most important questions possible and design the most effective methodologies I can. The outcomes are the outcomes. That's just the point of doing the research. And so that could have a dramatic change in how it is uh, we conduct research, we plan research, and what ultimately ends up in the literature itself. So there's some initial evidence from registered reports that have been published to date about the impact of this change uh, on research credibility. There are about 288 journals that offer registered reports now, but many of those have only adopted it in the last year or two. So the initial data comes from the first few years uh, of adoption. Next slide. One piece of evidence comes from Anne Scheel and her colleagues, where they compared standard reports, the way we write publications, papers now, uh, versus registered reports published in the same journal around the same time. What you're seeing here is the percentage of papers where their first hypothesis that they identified ended up being supported in the paper versus not. And what you can see is in standard reports, almost all of them, 95%, report findings that are consistent with the hypothesis, the hypothesis that they posed. In registered reports, it's less than half. We find out we're wrong a lot. Now, the less than half is probably what the reality of research is like all the time, right? If research was actually like the left bar, where almost all of our hypotheses were confirmed, then why would we bother doing the research in the first place? We already know what's gonna happen. We don't need to do the research if we always are right. <laughs> so the value here is that registered reports is functionally eliminating publication bias. It's eliminating the likelihood that those, those ideas that we had initially, that we fail to find out that we were wrong, or we fail to report that we found out uh, that we were wrong about those things. Now, of course, when we share this kind of data with editors, that leads often to a response of, oh, I don't know then if I wanna put registered reports in my journal, because if I'm putting all of these papers where the hypotheses weren't re supported or we get negative results, then my journal will lose its impact factor because people don't, aren't interested in that stuff and they won't cite it and it won't advance research. Now, whether we think that being influenced by impact factor is the right thing or, or not, it nevertheless is part of the reward system for editors and journals to think about those issues. So it's at least a reasonable question to ask whether publishing register reports is associated with a change in citation impact. 
the next slide uh, shows that we uh, looked at this with some of the initial registered reports, and again, comparison journals published in the same journals, uh, comparison articles published in the same journals around the same time. And the 100 here indicates that registered reports and comparison articles, standard reports, are cited about the same. Above the line indicates that registered reports are cited more frequently than comparison standard reports, and below the line would mean standard reports cited more. So what we can conclude from this analysis of Google Scholar, Scopus, and Web of Science databases is that if anything, registered reports in this initial sample are cited a little bit more, but probably would say about the same amount, but not strong evidence for difference uh, in uh, amount of citation. And that's despite the fact that many, most of those registered reports are reporting negative results as a primary outcome. So why might that be? Well, one possibility obviously is that we're just wrong that negative results are inherently less interesting and less citable. But another possibility is that the registered reports model itself protects against some of that. So if as a reviewer and editor, you have to decide, do I wanna know the answer to this question? Right? I mean, we don't have the data. So your, the basis of your evaluation is this is an important question. We need to know the answer and this is a good methodology. If you give that a thumbs up, then you're interested in the outcome regardless of what it is. You want to know what the answer is. So a negative result is an informative result. And often as a reviewer, you will ensure that the study, for example, is powered sufficiently so that a negative result is meaningful uh, compared to uh, just a underpowered, well, we don't know if anything happened uh, kind of study. A second additional possibility is that by conducting peer review in advance, it changes what advice the expert reviewers can provide. When I get my reviews back from the standard model and the reviewers point out all of these errors in my methodology, all I can do is feel bad because we already did the studies. Geez, why didn't you tell me that before I did them? That would have really helped make sure I get this, uh, make sure this work is good. Uh, and then I just have to send it to the next journals and hope they don't care uh, as much about those flaws. Acknowledge them, but sort of say, oh, but we still learned something here. In registered reports, when the reviewers point out flaws in my methodology, I say, oh, thanks, and change the methodology because we haven't done the studies yet. So the opportunity with registered reports is that we could potentially increase the rigor of the research itself by having peer review engaged at the right time for it to impact the methodology. And the next slide uh, shows the, the uh, design of a study that we did to test just that. This just went into press uh, at Nature Human Behavior, but we did a re uh, engaged a new peer review process of 29 registered reports and 57 comparison articles by the same authors or published in the same journal on similar topics. And we recruited peer reviewers, maybe some of you, uh, to review those on 19 outcome criteria. And for the purposes of time, I'm just gonna give you a brief uh, taste of the result and refer you to the paper if you wanna get into it. But if you go to the next slide, what we observe is that uh, here is those 19 outcome criteria. And in three groups, we had the reviewers evaluate the first half of the paper before they knew the research outcomes for the standard reports and the registered reports and rate them on quality of methods, rigor of the methods, how much will be learned, et cetera. And then in the second part, we had them evaluate after they read the whole set, the whole studies at the end. So they now read the results and the discussion. They have to report on how, what's the rigor of the analysis or the conclusions justified, the quality of the results, et cetera. And then they finished the paper, read the abstract and gave global ratings of the overall paper. And on all 19 criteria, registered reports were rated more positively uh, than the comparison articles from substantially more like methods rigor and analysis rigor and overall quality to slightly uh, more, at least uh, to the right side of the uh, zero point. These are 95% credible intervals, uh, not uh, confidence intervals, a Bayesian analysis here. But nevertheless, what you can see is that there are there is evidence across these criteria of improved rigor and quality of registered reports versus the comparison articles. 
Now, this is an initial study, right? It's 29 registered reports. There may be lots of changes uh, that occur and lots of variation on these outcome criteria or others that haven't been investigated that would qualify a conclusion of, oh, let's just all do registered reports. Of course, the standard model has lots of use cases, even in an environment where registered reports are common because of things like <clears throat> discoveries that happen after the fact and the, want, uh, the, the goal of promoting exploratory work. But what this at least suggests is that this kind of model may both alter the reward system so that we can focus on the things that we want to focus on. I don't need to get the exciting results. I need to ask the important questions and design great studies and potentially improve the rigor of the work while simultaneously eliminating publication bias. So that has a lot going for it to continue to advance and study the effects of this kind of adoption on sh both shifting the research culture and changing the credibility of evidence itself. Okay, so I wanna just highlight in next slide uh, that the culture is changing. There are lots of indicators of different behavior that, you, that researchers are adopting new behaviors. I'm just gonna give you a couple of examples from the OSF, the open science framework uh, that we operate, but many other services uh, likely show similar kinds of adoption rates. So this is just showing you the number of people uh, that are registered as users. It's a free service, so if you're not registered, I encourage you to go try it out yourself. But the number of users year over year is accelerating uh, non-linearly uh, of the OSF. It's well over 300,000 now. Next slide shows you the number of studies that are registered on the OSF, likewise showing a dramatic uh, increase year over year in the number uh, that uh, are getting registered. And psychology as a research community is leading the way. Next slide. Uh, then this is showing uh, data of people who are visiting the OSF to consume content, whether data or materials are shared, whether pre-registrations there, preprints uh, posted, and that likewise is increasing. So both producers of research and consumers of research are taking advantage of open science practices more and more year over year. You can even see in that box, just the stats from 2020 alone, 3.27 million files got added to the OSF. Two million of those made public. You can use the OSF privately and publicly because some things can't be shared publicly, but you can still use it for collaborative management and preservation of sensitive content that can't be just presented uh, and shared openly. And of those things shared openly, 36 million downloads uh, of those files. So there's a lot happening in individual researchers' behaviors. There's also a lot happening in the stakeholders of science changing their approach to incentives and policies and norms. So next slide shows a summary of adoption of transparency policies by journals, both a random sample of journals in the blue uh, and a selection of high impact journals by subdiscipline in the red. And what you see here are uh, uh, 10 different criteria by which you can rate the transparency of the policies of that journal and the amount of adoption uh, by uh, these rand uh, random sample of journals and high impact journals. It is not yet 50% on any criterion. Uh, and in fact, there's much lower on some and much higher on others. But compared to 10 years ago, 2011, this was essentially zero. No journals had policies in psychology about these particular practices. And by now, about a third uh, have policies, and this is increasing rapidly year over year. In fact, APA just announced a few months ago that it is adopting this framework called the top guidelines for all of its journals uh, that it publishes. And that's gonna dramatically increase the rates uh, that are shown here. So the stakeholder groups like journals and funders and institutions are starting to change their approach and the research community as a grassroots effort is changing their behaviors as well. So let me close, so there's a few minutes uh, for questions uh, with an, a consideration of all of this. Next slide. It can feel in open science that it's an all or none proposition. Boy, this seems big, there's a lot there. I don't, you know, I, I've been doing things this way for a long time, I don't know how to get started. And that is a big barrier to adoption of some of these practices because there are a lot of things and there's lots of mixed messages and lots of complications for some of these practices in particular contexts for how can I start to adopt some of these behaviors. The key mindset, I think, that's 
that's useful in this context is that being a good scientist is an exercise in continuous self-improvement. Right? Think of this in the same way that you think of your statistical training uh, or your adoption of new methods. You don't just say, oh, I'm going to know, know statistics now, or I'm not going to know statistics. No, you, you go piece by piece. Oh, I'm going to learn a little bit here. Oh, I have a need here. Let's learn a little bit more there. And you build a repertoire of skills and abilities and strategies that you can use as you gain additional statistical or methodological acumen. The same is true in open science. There's a lot of different behaviors. It's not an all or none proposition. I love incrementalism. Incrementalism is a bad word in science because it feels like, oh, you're just adding more information to things that we already know. That's what science is. And that's what we are as we're building up skills uh, to do better science. So piece by piece is a great way to go in starting to get into uh, some of these behaviors. Next slide gives you a couple of different routes, how you might think about getting started in your uh, individually and in your community. Uh, and these slides are shared, so you'll be able to go back to these. But example being uh, the, at the top, a paper that provides an annotated reading list of here are seven things that one can do to do open science behaviors. And here are some papers to help you get started in that. It's a great way uh, to get started into this. If you want to review the evidence about replicability and reproducibility, the second paper there. If you want guidance on sharing a preprint, oh, I hear about everybody using SciArchive now. How do I do that? There's a new paper by Mo Schantz and her colleagues uh, that gives very structured guidance for how to start doing that. You might be concerned about sharing data and materials. Oh, I don't know how this applies in this context or if I can do it ethically or what about what how do I de-identify efficiently and what criteria do I have to meet for IRB for that? The paper by Meyer provides some great guidance uh, for this. And then there are some additional ones here of things that you can try. At the bottom is the Open uh, Scholarship Knowledge Base, which is a collection of resources for education, for teaching, for research, to get started in any kind uh, of open science, open scholarship practices. So there are many routes to get in. Right now, you just need one. And you try that one, and you see how it goes, and it will start to accumulate. And the benefits of you doing that one have compounding benefits to the culture change that we opened with. Next slide. Science doesn't change by fiat of someone on high saying, now this is how science is going to operate. How you and I learned to do research and what the right way uh, to do research is through peer influence. Right? We observe the norms in our field, what others do, and we learn from influencing each other about the ways to advance and improve our research practices. The way that the culture will change is by taking advantage of that network effect of when you do something and it's visible, then others that are near neighbors to you will be influenced by you, and it may make it more likely that they will adopt those behaviors, particularly if they're valued behaviors. The key for this is for initial adoption and visibility of that adoption and connection to things that people already agree with, like the values that they have for science, like the things that they want to do and they're trying to do. This part on the left of the initial slide rather than the careerism parts uh, on the right. Next slide. And that normative work, that grassroots work that we are each influencing each other by our own behaviors can then be supported and help support the change of the other stakeholders in the overall uh, ecosystem of research, right? Institutions and how they decide who to hire and who to promote. Publishers and deciding criteria for publication. Funders and deciding criteria for grants. And societies for advancing that conversation and norms of how it is we are doing research, very much like uh, this session itself and APA's increased advocacy for open science practices. So the answer for how do we change the system is that we change ourselves and by making our own behaviors visible and, and working with others that have adopted those behaviors as well, that will then change the system as a whole and help the, the others that also need to change simultaneously to solve the coordination problem, change their own practices too. So I will stop with that. Uh, you see in the next slide some links uh, to the uh, more information about some of the things that I mentioned. 
These slides are available for download in the control panel, but you can also get them uh, from uh, the OSF. The link is right there on there. And I put a bunch of references for readings uh, into the slides. So if you access them, you can get those readings to go deeper on any of the points uh, that came up. Thanks everyone for attending. I really appreciate uh, the time that you put uh, into this and I'll welcome any time we have for questions in the last few minutes. Thank you, Brian. That was really great. We do have uh, about five minutes or so for questions and we got lots of them for you. Uh, one person asks, uh, a few years ago, you mentioned in a talk that there aren't many incentives for researchers to do studies that try to replicate the findings from previous studies. And you recommended in that talk that funding agencies provide grants that incentivize researchers to do this type of replicative research. Do you know if these types of grants actually <laughs> exist today? Great question. Uh, so yes, they do. Uh, the Dutch funding organization, the NWO, offers grants for replication research, research specifically. Uh, and NSF uh, in the US has issued a Dear Colleague letter from the SBS, the Social Behavioral Sciences Division, saying that they welcome applications uh, for replication research. So there is some shift uh, by funders to try to support uh, more replication studies. And there may be other individual funders that are willing on a case-by-case -case basis. The other thing that helps with making replication research easier is submitting it as a registered report. Because it's uncertain whether I will be able to publish this replication uh, if I do it in advance, because who knows how people respond to the outcomes. Submitting it as a registered report, as a proposed replication, lowers the barrier to even trying. Let's see if others agree that this is an important study to replicate. And then you can hold back on actually implementing the resources to do the replication until you get commitment that this is publishable. Thanks for that question. Great, thank you. Another person asks, um, how have contracts with publishers, such as the recent one between Elsevier and the University of California, contributed to open science efforts? Good question. Yeah, the the much earlier uh, than open science in terms of the behaviors that I was talking about of what researchers do has been the movement for open access, making the published literature itself more widely available, not uh, behind uh, subscription paywalls. And that model uh, is changing. There are many more stakeholders that have gotten involved in the idea that uh, the science should be more publicly accessible. If it's a public good, then let's not lock it uh, behind paywalls. Uh, but that business model is changing bit by bit, uh, and much of the research literature is becoming publicly accessible, but not all of it is. Uh, but different publishers are finding uh, new ways to try to adapt their business models to help promote uh, that uh, degree of openness. So APA, for example, embraces preprints. Uh, and is a supporter of preprints. Uh, there's connection, in fact, between SciArchive. If you go to SciArchive.com on the OSF, you'll see that you can even submit uh, your preprint uh, to APA journals uh, through a, a link that was established uh, to make it easier to submit to APA. So the adoption of preprints is a step towards uh, promoting open access, where you can make your manuscript version of the paper available publicly so that anybody can get access to it. And the publisher, if it's uh, the, pa the final paper is not open, then the, the neat and typeset version uh, may remain behind a paywall. That's one model of many models that are being pursued to adapt how open the literature is, regardless of the quality of that literature. Fantastic, thank you. Someone asks an interesting question here. Can you talk a little bit about your own personal journey? What sparked your interest in open science? What motivated you to dedicate so much of your time and energy to advocating for open science? And, and how can we inspire others to have that same level of interest and passion for open <laughs> science? Well, you don't have to have the same level. I'm obsessed <laughs> and you do not need to be obsessed. You can right. be obsessed with doing the best work that you can. Uh, and if that means greater transparency, great. But you don't have to drop everything <laughs> and say, I'm gonna <laughs> spend all my time uh, shaking the open science tree for everybody else. Uh, that's asking a lot. If you want to do some of that, fabulous. I'm here. Let's collaborate. Uh, but the 
I, my own interest in this was sparked in uh, when I got into graduate school. I started in 1996, and uh, my second year, I took uh, Alan Kasdan's research methods class, and we read these papers uh, from 30 years prior, from Jacob Cohen, Tony Greenwald, uh, Paul Meal, Robert Rosenthal, where they articulated all these problems, right? Low-powered research, publication bias, file drawer, lack of replication, and they outlined all the solutions. And we re were reading these papers in the late 90s, and, I, and we're saying, huh, we've known the problem, we've known the solution, and here we are 30 years later, and these papers read fresh, as fresh today as when they were written. Like, nothing has changed. What's up with that? So that's where I got very interested in this as a structural problem. It isn't that we don't know what to do, we don't know how to do it, it's that the system does not encourage us uh, to do it. And so that for me was the entry point to say, okay, well, I can't change the system, I'm just one person, but I can change my own practices. And so how, what can I do? And so Project Implicit actually started uh, to try to increase the power of our research designs investigating implicit bias. It'd be a lot more convenient if we had more people. Let's try doing research on the internet. That'd be crazy. This was 1998. It sort of sounded crazy at the time. Uh, but that was super effective at addressing power. And then over time, we've just in the lab had uh, increasing standards for ourselves to try to be more and more transparent. Uh, and then money arrived that allowed us to start an organization. And so I just sort of rode a wave uh, into doing it in the way that I'm doing it now. So thanks for that question. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. It went by so quickly. There's so much more that we can talk about. Hours and hours of more conversation. Yeah. Um, I want to thank our guest, Brian Nosek, for taking the time to talk to us today. It's been very informative. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. At the end of this uh, webinar, please take that short survey for you uh, to let us know a little bit about how we can improve our webinars and content that you might be interested in. And uh, that concludes our webinar. Many thanks to everyone for being here today. Um, have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Brian.